It's time for Security Now. Steve Gibson is here. We'll talk a little bit about uh, security news. There's some sci-fi news, uh, some reviews. Steve likes to throw those in. And your questions, Steve's answers, BitTorrent Sync, and other topics coming up next on Security Now. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is, is Twit. Audio bandwidth for security now is provided by the new Winamp for Android, featuring wireless sync and one-click iTunes import. Now with free daily music downloads and full-length CD listening parties. Download it for free at winamp.com slash Android. Video bandwidth for security now is provided by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. It's time for Security Now with Steve Gibson, episode 407, recorded June 5th, 2013. Your questions, Steve's answers, number 169. Security Now is brought to you by ProXPN. ProXPN is a virtual private network that allows you to use the Internet the way it should be, anonymously and without oversight. For 20% off your new account, go to proxpn.com slash twit and use the offer code SN20. And by audible.com. To download a free audiobook of your choice, go to audiblepodcast.com slash security now. It's time for security now, the show that protects you and your loved ones online, protects your privacy. All thanks to the fellow we call our explainer-in-chief. That's me, he says. Steve Gibson of GRC.com. How you doing, Steve? Hey, Leo. It's great to be with you again, as always. Good to Shouting see you. Shouting to each other at about a 500-mile distance. Yeah, but that's unfortunate. Thanks to, thanks to Skype, we're, uh, it's just like you're in the same room with me. Does so. your T-shirt say anything, or is it just blue? It's the, I didn't realize this was the Mount Fuji, the, the, this Atari logo. Oh, yes. It was actually Mount Fuji, which yes. is very cool. Yeah. Uh, like Nolan that. Bushnell was actually a really cool guy. The word Atari itself is a uh, term from the game of Go. Atari, yes. Yeah, so yeah. he was, yeah, he's an interesting feller. Mm -hmm. so, so we have a Q&A this week. Mm -hmm. uh, as, our, as always, great feedback from our listeners, comments, questions, thoughts, observations, worries, concerns, all the standard things you would expect from a security-oriented audience, and uh, some interesting news bits. I'm going to share a couple, uh, the meat of a couple interesting articles, and we're, we've got a really interesting video I want to put on into our record from uh, this morning's Today Show. There is a mysterious new way that bad guys are opening cars with apparently zero effort. Oh, great. Yeah. It's probably the more high-tech, fancy cars. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like right. I said, if it can go wrong. It will. Yeah. <laughs> We've learned what, if you've learned nothing from this show, you've learned that much. That's why you, I love my, like I've said before, I've got a, an, a what is that? I think it's an 04 Little, you know, a little 300 series Beamer, which is coming up on 10 years old, is just where I like it because I'm thinking, okay, they can't get me. My car's too stupid Let to open its doors. <laughs> you actually have well, to I want, I want have a, a dumb Think car. about a key. I mean, that's such a primitive thing, this uh, specially shaped them. piece of metal. Oh, yes. Yeah, that has and to. I think the little wiggles absolutely do nothing. I think they're just there to pacify <laughs> turn, us. Turn the tumblers in just such a way that yeah, the lock goes. I don't think it does that anymore. I think <laughs> no, mostly it just wiggles, and then there's a little electronic communication going it's a, on. It's a serving suggestion. Even even a decade ago, they'd figured that much out. <laughs> hey, let's uh, before we get into the meat of the matter, let's talk a little bit about Pro XPN. We've talked about it uh, before. You yeah. uh, took a look at it and gave it your uh, your St Steve Gibson seal of approval, I'm glad to say. They are uh, a sponsor of this show, I think partly because they know that the people who listen to this show are, uh, are smart, security aware, and the kind of people who might want to use a VPN, a virtual private network. Uh, we've talked about a number of different companies that offer this service. I think you should very much consider Pro XPN for a number of reasons. They do have a free offering that you can try out, and that's always kind of nice. I like companies that do that. But the other reason you might want to go to Pro XPN is uh, to take a look at their implementation, and that's what Steve did. He really made sure that it was doing the right thing, and it, it does. For instance, uh, of course, uh, OpenVPN is the backbone of their operation, a very good solution. There are mobile platforms that don't, in fact, the big ones, that don't support OpenVPN. For them, 
the less desirable but still uh, better than nothing PPTP is available. You get to choose. You got a 512-bit encryption tunnel, a 2048-bit key. That's nice. And here's the thing that I think is kind of interesting, too. You get to decide where you want to egress the virtual private network. You can, you know, they've got servers in Dallas, Seattle, London, Singapore, Los Angeles, New York City, and Amsterdam. Why does that matter? Well, because you can, in effect, say, this is my country of origin. You, uh, it, so, the, so if you are trying to use something that's geographically restricted, you get to choose U.S., U.K., Asia. Uh, if your ISP is becoming annoying with a six strikes rule, they'll never know what you're doing because you're protected via a VPN. Uh, their software for Windows and Mac gives you even more advanced control. You can actually say, I want web traffic and email to go through the VPN. Everything else can go direct or vice versa. Uh, it'll it'll uh, work with a, an iOS or Android device with no app. That's nice. World-class customer support. And a very special deal when you visit uh, proxpn.com slash twit. Let me type that in and I'll show you the page so you know what to uh, to look for. It's going to have a little uh, welcome twit fans there at the bottom. Thanks for checking out ProXPN. Give us a try. Uh, try out that XPN premium account. Of course, you can cancel any time with the first seven days for a full refund. But I think you might want to take a look at it. Now, normally that uh, Pro account is $9.95 a month, $75 if you buy an entire year. But if you use an offer code SN20, you'll get 20% off for the lifetime of your account. That means if you if you go with the a yearly plan, use our SN20 code, you'll be less than five bucks a month. And that's forever. ProXPN.com slash twit. If you're looking for a VPN to protect you at open access spots, you absolutely shouldn't be using a hotel internet without some VPN support. Uh, open off open access points. There's lots of reasons you might want a pro VPN from proxpn.com slash twit. And again, don't forget. SN20 for 20% off, not for a month or a year, but for the life of your account. Somebody in the chat room, uh, Richard Jess, says, I love a, an ad for a VPN on, on uh, Twitter. Yeah, I do too. <laughs> I love that too. Pro XPN, we chose them. They're the best. Steve Gibson, let's uh, see here. What's, uh, what do you want to start with? Uh, you want to start so with let's this car thing? I do, and, and the reason I it works for the podcast is that audio is descriptive enough that that people who are not able to see it are able to hear it and 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 cuz cuz the story explains itself and i've also just tweeted the link to the story uh which appeared on the today show this morning and it's very apropos to this podcast yeah. they're stumped police say by the mystery car thefts i think we're going to have an ad here so let me just Oh, yeah, yeah, we'll just sit and watch that for a little bit. I should have started it earlier. I should know better. <laughs> should know better. Um, yeah, yeah, so um, we'll we'll look at this and then talk about it. I have a theory about what's going on, which appears to be more than anybody else has at this point. Right. But, you know, just based on the evidence. Well, that's the thing. We know the symptoms. We don't know the cause yet. Right. Uh, here we go. We have a Rawson Reports crime alert to tell you about this morning. A new wave of auto thefts that police, frankly, can't figure out. Today, National Investigative Correspondent Jeff Rawson is here with more. Jeff, good morning to you. Hey, Savannah, good morning. This is a real mystery. Look, when you lock your car and you set the alarm on it, you think your car is pretty safe. But as you're about to see, criminals have designed a new high-tech gadget, giving them full access to your car. Police <laughs> are so baffled, they actually They've want got you to video. watch That's this the thing. video. To see yes, if, if you can be, help because every case. every garage everywhere has 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 security video now, Long so they know Beach, how it's they know it's working. Watch as this thief moves in. So it's a late model SUV. SUV. In a he walks up he's to carrying it, carrying a small device in the palm of his hand. You can barely see it, but he aims it at the car and pops the lock. Oh, look at that! The light comes on, the door opens, and says, "Come on in." Everything, <laughs> no at all. Probably a nice little chime. Yeah. Yeah. Wait a minute. Hits Another They're doing multiple cars. Using that Holy same cow. Handheld device. Holy cow. Deputy Police Chief David Hendricks is mystified. 
This is bad in the sense that we're stumped. You're stumped. We are stumped. So we don't have we to don't show the whole thing. What What do you think the uh, well, What do you think's I, I, going I, I, on here? There, there's another example. Owning your right, car shows. remote, which is virtually impossible to do. Here's why: on most cars, when you hit the unlock button, it sends a code to the car. That code is encrypted and constantly changing, and it's should those, be hack. Is it a standard rolling code, or are they doing something? Way to crack it. Clearly. It is probably a, a sequential one-time. one of the one country's time. leading right. security experts. He's watched the tapes, and he's stumped too. This is really frustrating because clearly they figured out something that looks really simple. I mean, whatever it is they're doing, it just takes seconds to do. And you look and you go, that should not be possible. It's happening from California to What Illinois. I want to know is Adrian, what makes, uh, yeah, pretty what model. And he's about to, he's about to tell Michael you. Michael Shin. His home security camera caught this crook breaking into his Honda Accord using a similar device. But you'd never know it. He looks like the owner of the car. Sure does. Unlocking the doors remotely and silently. The thief stole cash and an expensive cell phone. It was shocking. It just opens magically um, <laughs> without him having to do anything. Adding to the mystery, police say the device works on some cars but not others. These thieves try to open a Ford SUV and the Cadillac. No luck. But this Acura SUV and sedan pop right open. Hmm. And they always seem to strike on the passenger side. Oh, that's Investigators yep. don't know why. We've reached out to the car manufacturers, the that's manufacturers really of vehicle alarm systems. And so far, nobody seems to know what this technology is. That says a lot about how sophisticated these criminals are. When you look at the video and you see how easy it is, it's it's pretty unnerving. Well, the criminals probably aren't that sophisticated, uh, but they're probably uh, exactly. buying them from somebody who is, obviously. Yes, right? there, there's no chance that these random schmoes, you know, who are in stealing people's cell phones and, and yeah, spare they change. They don't look that smart. <laughs> and, and also, no one is actually stealing the car. At the top of the story, they called it car theft. And so it's car contents theft. Right. So this is not... Dealing with the ignition system, apparently, my theory is based on looking at the videos that they're they're doing some sort of a high energy transfer, whether it's magnetic ah. or electromagnetic or 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 radio. Um, they're they're they they seem to have to get very close. You know, no bad guy would want to be in physical proximity if they could avoid it. If this thing worked ten feet away, they'd open the door are, first. Right? Exactly, and a so radio they do have would to get right up to next to it. It looks like, yeah, yeah, and and we know that cars are now covered with microprocessors. So, and, and there's something seems to be about the passenger side. My guess is it's simpler on that side. That is, there is nothing there, no other fancy electronics, not maybe as much as over on the driver's side. Just the, the I mean, there's probably a network which is connecting to the mechanical door lock there. And so there, my guess is that it, this is some sort of a device which is generating a signal that is, is able to penetrate the relatively thin sheet metal of the car door and confuse the electronics, which is basically it's a network controller. All of these cars now are based on, you know, we, we, we talked about the CAN, C-A-N network that, 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 that they run on. My guess is if they're just able to, like, overpower the, the normal signal and say, you've just been told to unlock yourself. And so the door says, oh, and unlocks a lot of cars um alarm will go off if you even if you just unlock the door you know if you yes. don't have the right uh key the alarm will go off yeah so they this, must be doing more than just simply pulling you know if you were if the when, let's say somebody left the window open and you could reach in and pull up the lock on the door and get in in most cases the alarm would still go off so they're bypassing so maybe, more than the it, they're more than just may, a magnetic thing it may be an unshielded area where they're yeah. able to gain access to the car's network and say, yeah. we've just told you to unlock. I think it has um, to be that. Otherwise, the alarms would go off. And I think, though, that, you know, it, it is the case that our cars are using a, a non-repeating sequence-based one-time passcode. You know, that's what this alarm technology is, which is why, you know, thieves, who, even who who copy the signal that your key emits can't use it again it it's exactly like our 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 event based one time password system they are, they're not doing that this is not a crypto attack i i think it's actually attacking essentially underneath the crypto level mm -hmm. at the car's network level 
So anyway, I'm I'm on record with my guests. I'm sure in weeks coming we will you know sooner or later someone's guy's going to get caught and we'll and this will get it out into the news i hope that you know we uh we see a news story and it's not all all, all hushed up but as you said leo that you know bad guys are buying this somewhere online right. this is you know coming from overseas and you you know it's like oh get this it's very I, I was reminded of you've probably seen those those generic tv blasters that like turn off any right. model make or model by sending all the off codes possible right I have so one I of those is, on uh, the Galaxy S4 and the HTC One. Both have uh, TV. <laughs> seriously, they both have TV uh, RF uh, remote control devices, and uh, you can pretty much walk into any bar and turn off anything from your phone. <laughs> Probably mean IR, IR remote. Control. That's what I said. What did yeah. I say? IR. That's what I meant. Yeah. Um, yeah. Somebody in the chat room suggested this is an interesting thought that it might be somehow related to the setting, and my car has this setting that automatically locks the doors when you get to a certain speed and unlocks them uh, when you arrive. And uh, if you perhaps had that setting uh, on your car, you might want to turn off that unlock setting. Well, the you know the, the advice is, and and at the moment, I don't think there's. I, I have I didn't have any time to do any research because I just saw this thing came in this morning. Um, we, I'm sure before long we will know what makes the models are vulnerable, and the takeaway for the time being is even more even more than usual. Do not leave valuable stuff in your car because if you've got a late model something or other it seems like right. suvs and it seemed to be um asian makes of cars i think they were hondas and acuras and so forth um they didn't like the ford or the cadillac for for whatever reason um maybe we just have thicker sheet metal who knows yeah. but anyway it'll be fun to see uh what this ends up what it ends up being hmm. but you know protect yourselves so speaking of protecting yourselves um this isn't really news, but I thought it was just sort of an important reminder. The Zeus Trojan is still out and about. Um, this was it, the, this. I was reminded of it by uh, Nicole uh, Pearlroth, who writes the New York Times Bits column, um, and we've talked about the Zeus Trojan. That's the banking Trojan. Um, essentially, it seems to be unsquashable. It is probably because it's just so lucrative. Um, it is backed by, we believe, Russian organized crime bad guys, and it is thriving on Facebook. Hmm. It is. It is the apparently people are, are po like posting fake Facebook profiles containing links that install the Trojan in your machine, and. Unlike other Trojans, this thing goes stealth until it sees you doing electronic banking to one of a growing number of banks that it, quote, supports, unquote, in which case it's able to do to intercept your keyboard and do pre-encryption capture. Um, and we've talked about this in the past. For example, the, it, it can even modify the, the 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 login forms adding fields like social security number which is not on your bank's normal you know form for logging in they add it in order to capture that information because that's valuable for resale for identity theft purposes so this is a an extremely sophisticated trojan specializing in in intercepting banking transactions and then sending this information off to bad, you know, organized crime groups in Russia. And it's on the rise. I mean, it's peaked just last month in May, um, largely finding uh, like it's it's sweet spot over on Facebook. So, you know, just to I, I don't know how you protect yourself from this, except, you know, to to keep the latest antivirus and. Uh, and maybe just try not to click every link that is offered. It, you know, usually these Facebooks, uh, they either come in on your wall uh, with a link or they come in as a, a message with a link. And a lot of times, I mean, in the past what we've seen is you'll get a message from a friend, by the way, because uh, it has yeah. to be, uh, yep. a friend who's been compromised. And the friend's message will say something like, hey, I got video from you last night. Oh, man, are you in trouble? And a link. Yeah, and uh -huh. uh, and the link, of course, is malicious in some form. Sometimes what it does is it pulls you to a page that looks like YouTube, 
but then it says, oh, you need to update your flash. <laughs> and then you, and because we all see that all the time, go, yeah, 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 yep. update it, update it. Probably of course, true. What you're not getting is flash. You're getting the malware uh, in, a, in a package that looks like a flash installer. So, yes. uh, yeah, be careful about links. Be careful about installing software from those links especially. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the EFF, our illustrious defenders of of the public trust, uh, on you know fo focusing on the internet, love uh, them. I know, uh, and we got a, they actually pop in here a couple times because they're back taking Bitcoin once again. Oh really? With, with, with yeah, with a really cool story. But this one first really caught my eye. Uh, there, the story was titled "From the EFF: Computer Scientists Urge Court." to block copyright claims in Oracle versus Google API fight. The, subta the subtitle was dozens of industry leaders urge APIs that are open are critical to innovation and interoperability. I'm just going to share the story. Dozens of computer scientists urged an appeals court today, and this is, I think was, Mar was May 30th, so just last week, to block the copyright claims over application programming interfaces in the Oracle versus Google court battle, and this is over Java, arguing that APIs that are critical, uh, I'm sorry, that are open, are critical to innovation and interoperability in computers and computer systems. The Electronic Frontier Foundation represents the 32 scientists, including leaders like MS-DOS author Tim Patterson, and ARPANET developer Larry Roberts. Tim Patterson's still around. Wow. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. That goes, wow. goes back. Wasn't way. he Seattle DOS? C -DOS? And yes. Then, yeah. That's where yeah. Gates bought, bought DOS from, from, yeah. from Tim. Yeah. Wow. Didn't pay him very much. No. Um, yeah. And, uh, that's another story. Anyway, <laughs> in the Alicus brief filed in the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit today, the group urges the court to uphold a decision from U.S. District J w Judge William Alsup finding that APIs are not copyrightable, which that's good news, explaining that Oracle's attempt to overextend copyright coverage in its case against Google was irreconcilable with the purpose of copyright law and the nature of computer science. Quote, the law is already clear that computer languages are mediums of communication and aren't copyrightable. Yay. Yes. Even though copyright might cover what was creatively written in the language, it doesn't cover functions that must all be written in the same way. That's, that's exactly the right language, unquote. Said EFF staff attorney Julie, Julie Samuels, quote, APIs are similarly functional. They are specifications that allow programs to communicate with each other. As Judge Allsup found under the law, APIs are simply not copyrightable material, hmm. unquote. Furthermore, as the scientists explain in today's brief, the real-world ramifications of copywriting APIs would be severe. All, copy, all software developers use APIs to make their software work with other software. For example, your web browser uses APIs to work with various computer operating systems so it can open files and display windows on the screen. If APIs are copyrightable, then developers can con control who can make interoperable software. Oh, I love that. Blocking competitors yeah. and creative yeah. new products. Thank you. And then again, quote, without the compatibility enabled by APIs that are open, we would not have the vibrant computer and internet environment we experience today with new products and services routinely changing the way we see and interact with the world, yes. said EFF fellow Michael Barclay. Continuing, APIs that are open spur the development of software, creating programs that the interface's original creator might never have envisioned. Mm -hmm. We hope the appeals court rejects Oracle's appeal, in this case, to protect 
technological innovation and you know here here so what's what's happening really does upset me because oracle is trying to close the java api against google yet oracle the entire value of the java api is ha, has been its openness the only reason that that Java is e even matters today. That it's on those three billion devices that we be keep being reminded of painfully, is because it was an open interface, and anyone could write to Java who wanted to. Mm. Now Oracle is trying to say to Google, "Oh no, you know, people can write to the API, but we're not going to let you implement the API." They're trying to you know maintain control of it, and so that's just. You know, that's really bad news. You know, there's there, for example, there are like this like free DOS that is a DOS clone. It, it's 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 completely written from scratch. No Microsoft copyrighted code in there. Yet it implements the DOS API, allowing DOS generation applications to run just as if they were on MS DOS. And there's something called React OS, which is a written from scratch Windows API clone that I've been watching for, for a few years and it's it's coming along. I mean and, and then we have, you know, POSIX and and the Unix API. I mean, you know, these interfaces have to be kept available and open and 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 it's really it's 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 the it's the the creator of it trying to have it both ways. They're trying to create the benefit of the initial openness and then come along later and say, oh, nobody else can can use it. So it's this is important. And I'm really glad that the EFF is there to establish some some precedent. And I mean, I'm almost glad that Oracle and Google are having this battle now because we do need some legal precedent established in the in hopefully in the correct direction um, going forward. Because what we're seeing is we're we're seeing that. Innovation is slowing down. Major organizations like Microsoft and, and Google, I mean, they've been on the other side of these things too, and Oracle, they're now trying to use the, the copyright system and the patent system to, you know, to, uh, to obtain material wealth in absence of uh, ongoing innovation. And, you know, that we, need to, we need to keep this in perspective. So we talked last week, one of our top of the, of the podcast stories, I, I went into detail into the announcement that Google had made about the way they were going to be changing their certificates. And what has popped up on the news, actually Sophos is the one story that I saw, but it looks, I think a, a number of people carried it, was that uh, my version of IE, IE8, which is the last one I am able to run, on XP. Now, this is not a big problem for me because I don't use IE. Um, I'm, you know, I my Firefox or I use now Opera. I've really kind of fallen back in love with uh, because it's so lean and mean. Or or Chrome. I mean, IE is the last browser that I will use. It does not have server name identification SNI, and that's that feature. Um, <coughs> Someone tweeted since last week, um, and I didn't confirm this, but the tweet was that SNI was actually relatively recent. It was in it was added to the SSL TLS spec in 06, says the tweet. I'm mm -hmm. I, I'm not I'm not stating that myself, but that's what the tweet says. Um, if so, it's like, well, okay, I guess recent is variable. That's you know seven years, which ought to be enough. Uh, it's not enough for IE, but it is enough for everybody else. So any state-of-the-art browser will already support uh, this SNI. That, that's the thing that allows multi-hosting on a single, uh, multi-secure hosting on a single IP, server name identification, SNI, where that, as I mentioned it last week, the first packet that the browser sends identifies the site that is the domain name of the server it wants to connect to at that IP. It has to be in the first packet because the second packet, which is which comes, which is the first packet being returned by the server, has to be the certificate for that site. So this the browser has to identify the site it wants 
immediately so that the certificate can be chosen from an array of them that are available to a multi-domain hosting server all at that one IP. Normally, it's, it's, where it's okay to wait until the protocol level transaction underneath that is, you know, in, in, the, in the secure tunnel after the uh, SSL TLS transaction has been set up. Not, however, if you've got multiple domains all sharing a single IP because the server doesn't know which one of the many the, the client wants. Well, so it turns out XP has no IE available to it, which um, has SNI enabled. But if you're running Firefox on XP or Chrome or Opera, that is to say anything but, you're fine. And this would only be a problem with this one particular domain on Google. Notice that there's a lot of XP still around. Nobody is running IE later than 8 because you can't. And this doesn't seem to be a big problem already. So, you know, so it will start to be a problem for this particular set of people and multi-domain hosting. And we, it just sort of came up because of Google's mention of it. So I'm staying on XP. Actually, when I rebuild my system, I, you know, I'll, I'll rebuild my system and I will absolutely be switching to 7. I'm completely comfortable now with Windows 7. Um, so I'll be... Boy, aren't you a I'll daredevil? Be, I'll be catching up. <laughs> Have you ever used Windows 8 at all? No. Actually, no. I, I have never, no. <laughs> I've never touched it. I just know it's bad. Actually, I've listened. To, I've, I've watched you trying to use it. Well, and with, 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 there was that one show with uh, Paul, yeah, Mary and, Jo, yeah, and Mary yeah. Jo, where you were, you had it, and you, half of the show was yeah. okay. Now yeah. wait a minute. What did uh, I, did I do? What I did? Wait, that? no, huh? I, I go on the right and I slide <laughs> over to the left. What? Oh, and then dear. I did love, I did love that great. Uh, um, uh, Chris, Chris Perillo uh, showing his dad. Yeah. Yes, the and the dad. Uh, we're very unscripted. Finally right. saying, are they trying to sell Apple Macs? You know. <laughs> <laughs> I should ask Chris if uh, if his dad what uh, his dad ended up using. That's a good question. No, never, never had. Never, to never, it. never. Hopefully, I won't have to. I'll just you know. Skip if, ahead. This is the. It's the every other OS phenomenon. I mean, they ought to just stop, Leo. Aren't they done? I mean, what more do we need? I do wonder sometimes if they're if, at this point. You're changing for change's uh, sake. Uh, Office I, uh, happened with Office like eight generations ago. Uh, yes, when they dropped the menu and yeah, went just to that change for old. change's sake because we yeah. have to give you a new version or you won't buy it. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, they, there's a fairly significant revision coming in the fall that might make Windows 8 uh, more tolerant. We'll see. Is that the 8.1 or yeah, Windows yeah. Blue or something? Yeah, Windows Blue 8.1. Oh, I, I I only know about it because I keep listening to you and Paul talking Thank about you. it. Thank you. I married you. We're glad you do. So um, I just wanted to mention that LinkedIn has finally joined Twitter and Evernote offering second factor authentication. LinkedIn has had big problems in the past with, with people hacking accounts. So they've... They've added second factor authentication. The bad news is, I don't know what it is with Twitter and LinkedIn that aren't going the right way. I Oh, by the way, I've also been loving listening to you loving the whole Google Authenticator style. Oh, it's so great. Yeah. I mean, you know, we talked about it on this podcast, five, you know, what, six or seven mm -hmm. years ago. Mm -hmm. We were ahead of the game, of course. That's our job. And now here it is in the real world. And, it, I mean, it is really cool, you know, to, to be able to bring that up and have these ever-changing numbers. Fabulous. I just, and so what the problem is people are reporting that they're now getting SMS spam after using LinkedIn's second-factor oh, authentication. tell me it isn't so. Yeah, I know. I know. Um, and weren't you also complaining that there was you? I think after you used you you set up Twitters and you started getting like unwanted stuff. Yeah, and that's not. And it may. I wonder maybe the same thing with LinkedIn. What it was is in order to use Twitter's authentication, you had to register a cell phone number with Twitter, and by course, default, to get SMS. Yeah, and by default, Twitter then starts sending stuff to your cell phone, like to, messages. Uh, and, uh, you know, you could turn that off. I just hadn't had a cell phone registered with okay. it yet. 
Okay. Uh, and it, maybe that's what happened with LinkedIn. But that's, uh, again, argues for using Google, uh, we're not, it's not yes. Google, but using that authenticator. Beca and, and, because then you don't have to set it up for a cell phone. You don't have that whole issue. And I'm not giving you anything. T-O-T-P, time-based, one-time password. Yeah. T -O -T -P. And then I could have one app that had it all. Right. You know, Facebook uses their own authentication built into the Facebook app. That's their way of making you have it. Uh, Twitter, you have, you know, it sends you a text. It's the only way to do it. Uh, I'm not sure what else link, LinkedIn does. Yeah, so I'm hoping that Twitter and LinkedIn will get with the plan. Maybe they just feel that, that requiring people to have an app is too high a bar and they just want to ease them into it, figuring that, well, everybody has a cell phone. We'll just send them an SMS message. Yeah. Isn't that just as good? And it's like, well, okay. You know. The good news is we're, we're moving towards a standard. We're really seeing everyone rallying around. Yeah. You know, we're, we're, we're uh, uh, oh, and by the way, I, I had my first experience using pay with Amazon worked frictionlessly uh. a couple days ago. I was very pleased. I went somewhere. It was uh, JR.com, the big electronics mm -hmm. retailer. And there it was under their button was pay with Amazon. It's like, ooh, cool. Let me see how this works. And, I, you know, just, I, it was fantastic. It was as good as as using the Google, uh, Google Pay uh, service. So I was very pleased with it. Makes sense. Yep. Now, yes. EFF. Yes. We'll, re we'll remember with a little sadness, back in, two, in 2011, they stopped ac ac accepting Bitcoin donations. And it was, I, I was only sad because it was them pulling back from, th 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 okay, their feeling at the time as they expressed it was, and we cover this on the podcast, was it, they, they worried it was being seen as an endorsement of Bitcoin. And they felt uncomfortable then making that endorsement. However, that Treasury Department financial document a few months ago that we also talked about that we're, we were overjoyed about, that solved their problem. That that's said to them, okay, users of Bitcoins, which is different than people who are, who are, are exchanges. We know that that can be apparently problematic if you're not, if you're not, official with the U.S. Uh, Treasury um, that apparently users are okay. Um, so they have resumed accepting Bitcoin donations uh, through a service called BitPay, which is one that they have chosen. Now, um, the, the headline was interesting because they said this week, the Electronic Frontier Foundation received a generous donation of 726 bitcoins worth currently $95,000 um, and some change in U.S. dollars. And then they said, see the blockchain transaction here. And they gave a link with the, you know, the whole Bitcoin crypto deal at blockchain.info uh, for the transaction. And they said, this is in addition to over 7,000 U.S. dollars we've received through Bitcoin donations in the last couple of weeks. Um, so what's interesting about this is it's their own Bitcoins coming back. What happened was back in 2011, when they decided to suspend accepting Bitcoin donations, they had a repository of Bitcoins and I think I remember the number at like 37 or 35,000 back then BTC, um, which they donated to the Bitcoin faucet. Just figuring, hey, you know, we're not, we don't feel comfortable exchanging this for dollars. So, but we want to, you know, support the community. So we're going to dump this on the Bitcoin faucet. We, and we talked about the faucet back in our original Bitcoin podcast. I interviewed the that, guy who uh, who did it. We had a triangulation episode with him cool yeah yeah and that yeah. was just a it was, it was a just to prime the pump it was yes it was a site you could go to and it just gave you a piece of a bitcoin yeah. just like here here's a bitcoin just to kind of get you started so you could kind of see it was cool so what happened was there had there had begun to be a problem with the faucet and fraud people were attacking it uh. and trying to pursue 
and trying to perpetuate fraudulent transactions. So the guy closed down the faucet. He said, okay, sorry, but we can't do it anymore. Right. Apparently there's a Minecraft faucet somewhere. <laughs> and he gave a bunch of Bitcoinage. Oh, that's interesting. To, he donated. So we're talking about Gavin Andresen, by the way, Andresen. Yes. Uh, who yes. is now chief scientist at the Bitcoin Foundation. That's why Oh, we, good. Yeah. Cool. He's like the front man. He's one of the few people who's ever emailed with Satoshi Nakamoto. <laughs> I think he might be Satoshi Nakamoto in a yeah. Kaiser Soze kind of way, but I don't know. <laughs> he so, denies it. Anyway, so in his distributing funds, the Minecraft faucet got some. He also kindly paid off some of the major mining groups that that took a financial hit during that recent fork mm -hmm. in the in 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 the in the bit chain where the, there was that chain fork that we covered on the podcast he helped to to give them some um some relief and he gave 700 of the bitcoins essentially that the EFF originally donated wow. back so Gavin, now worth 95 Ninety-five thousand dollars. That's putting so. you in your Bitcoin where your mouth is. Very cool. Yeah, for him. And this is totally random, but I thought it was fun. There is an iPad app, and this apropos to the podcast, an iPad app called the iHeart Locket Diary, which is, is the, the the picture is adorable. It shows a, a I don't know maybe a six or seven or eight year old. Uh, youngster, female, a girl, um, with her, wearing her locket around her neck. This thing produces a coded audio sequence, which which the iPad can hear. What? And unlock her secret personal diary. Oh. And I just think that's really neat. <laughs> yep. And so, and so, it's her. It's her little techno secret that she wears around her neck. So, so you know, very much like a, a, an old style diary that key. Is so cool. <laughs> I'm and getting then one there's of those. A, there's another button that allows you to hide or reveal your secret writing. So you can press the other button, and then again, and then and then. And then your writing mysterious, your secret writing appears, allowing wow. you to hide your annotations from mom and dad. So I just thought that was way cool. Just I a, want. Neat, a neat, <laughs> neat application. I love of, it. That's of great. That is so cool. I love it. I thought you would like that one. And now we have the dumb security story of the week. Uh, arguably unlocking passenger doors without needing a key or needing some sort of a weird thing, it might be dumb. This is arguably dumber. This is courtesy of our frequent contributor, Simon Zarafa. Uh, this was a posting on uh, a, uh, a, 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 a web app security uh, group. Quote, our sites, our, I'm sorry, our state's governor's office recently started a health clinic for state employees. This clinic, run by a third party, set up a website to allow users to set up appointments at the clinic and to provide private health information. When setting myself and my family members up, I was startled to receive a warning saying that the password I wanted to use was not available. <laughs> oh. You mean somebody else used it? And I needed to <laughs> choose another one. What? Understand that this wasn't because I failed to meet the password criteria, but because that particular password was already in use. And then he explains, in fact, I wanted to use the same password for my children's accounts since they are under age and I will be setting up their appointments anyway. So, and so, and it sounds like he chose a very secure password, you know, very random, lots of random gibberish. And so he says, I entered the same password as for my account. So it accepted it the first time for him. Then he received, he says, and received this error message, quote, 
that password and then it put it up on the screen as it just no showed it, it showed it to him <laughs> yes so they had stored it they had not hashed it there it was is already in use please choose another he says i raised my concerns about this yeah. to the third party provider yeah and was told they are requiring unique usernames and passwords mm. for enhanced security. Oh, yeah, that makes it more secure, sure. <laughs> Especially when you show it to them. I replied <laughs> that since the web application is helpfully telling me that a password is already in use and would also tell me that a username is already in use, wow. I could develop a dictionary attack yeah. to build a list of known passwords and known usernames, put the two together, and be able to access accounts. This would provide me with social security numbers and health-related private information about other users. Wow. I raised this issue with our state security officer, who told me that they were told not to comment. Am I out of line oh, here? Oh, wow. I'm a user. I'm a, use, a Unix server admin, not a security pro. So I'm certainly not up to date on best practices for web apps. But this unique password idea strikes me as a severe problem. <laughs> it bothered me. I, <sighs> what do you think it means? Uh, so uh, I don't know. What would they be using as a, as a password technology if they couldn't have duplicates? Well, okay. They, uh, it, it's a, they could be using a, well, they're not, they're not doing any of this, but like trying to give them like the benefit of the doubt, yeah. they could be using a salt and a hash yeah. and see a collision of the hashes and, ah. and, and then say this password is in use. But, but again, who cares? They shouldn't care is the point. But we know they're not doing that, nor are they using a unique salt because then even the same password with unique salt would not would would give them uh, would not give them the same hash, in which case they could not detect a duplicate password and passwords would automatically be allowed. But they're not doing that. So and the fact that they are later when a separate account is being set up Later, oh, and obviously with a different username, because otherwise that you'd be, you know, you would have a username collision. So they are clearly storing the passwords in the clear, in and that's the because that's the only way they could be returning it. Well, okay, wait a minute. That's not true. They could be holding it. Um, they they could yeah, have they could have run the hash on it, saw the hash collision, yes. and then have and just then, been storing that password because yes. you just entered it. And yes, said, hey, you know right. this thing we already so, we already have that one. Yeah, so so as a user convenience, they might have been sending back to you the password you just gave them, right? Because there was a hash collision, right. and so they're saying it's in use. So but maybe, what would the harm be in a hash collision? None. None. Zero. Leo. No. I mean, it's absolutely, you know, you want, I mean, how we know how many people First use First of all, money. they're highly unlikely, right? How well, likely is a hash collision? Pre well, presume, well, it's, it's. it's I guess for monkey thing. one, two, three, it's going to happen. That's the point. <laughs> yeah. So, so the hash collision is, a, is as likely as the, the password right. being hashed, assuming that they're either unsalted or a static salt. Right. And not a dynamic salt per account. You know, it'd be nice. What you'd like to use uh, is a, you know, like a hash based on the account name, which then hashes the password, and then they're going to all be different. Right. So then you would not detect a collision. And there's no, no one has ever, no one before has ever seen a, a requirement that your password be unique, which tells you this is not a good idea. So, yeah. If anyone is listening who happened to have implemented that system or is at the state, where this person was, uh, you know, change this. It's bad. And, and we, you know, we do know the word of these bad things gets out. I've been very impressed by the response of bank, most banks in, in the wake of the SSL labs revelation that their, their SSL security rated an F. Many of them have immediately fixed their servers because it's not hard to do. 
you know, it's a few minutes of of some admin just removing some, you know, removing SSL2 support, which is typically a config file, and re and and moving one cipher up to the top in order to to prevent you from from having the beast attack. Right. No biggie. Just have it done. You know, and here's and, an interesting uh, thought. Somebody in the chat room said, "You know what they're doing?" <laughs> They're using your password as the database key. <laughs> they can't have duplicate database keys, so they want each password to be unique. Could be. That's a, actually that's not a bad thought. That would that be maybe that the actual collision creates a technological a problem. Technical for difficulty. Yeah. Yes. Like oh. that. Whatever it is, it would be wow. bad. Wow. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. So a little sci-fi movie and TV news update. Uh, Jenny and I saw After Earth. Oh, boy, the review's bad. 12% really? on Rotten Tomatoes. I know, 12%. I think it's a five-point-something on IMDb. We didn't hate it. Because um, you, you know, missed it. <laughs> Would you go? You really went. We don't know. We saw it. And we you didn't walk it. out knowing, on it. Knowing how bad it was, yeah. the, the, the problem it had... I mean, it wasn't wonderful. It wasn't a state-of-the-art, killer, amazing sci-fi yeah. movie. This is the Will was... Smith, Jaden Smith, yes, adventure. Yes. And, yeah. and and as we and afterwards, Jenny was puzzled as to why it had been so roundly hated. Right. And I said, "Well, what I read because I read all the hateful reviews first, and and the the people who most disliked it were upset that there was no surprises." That is, you did know, and this is not a spoiler because, I mean, it spoils itself, that you know right off the bat what the movie is about and so what the kid's mission is, right. you know, because dad's legs are broken and kids got to go through it, go on a long trek. And so that's the movie. But it was, you know, it, was, it wasn't horrible. So for what it's worth, I don't know if it's worth what movies cost these days because they're getting pretty expensive. Um, so you know, I'm I'm still liking Oblivion as my uh, really, really, really enjoyed it movie of of the summer, and uh, I can't wait for Man of Steel. That's my I'm, yeah, I'm excited I'm about that one. Breathless for that one. Hope that's we good. also saw we also saw Now You See Me, which was the you know the magic act with uh, Jesse Eisenberg. Yeah, I want to see that. Does that, that look was that good? Something felt missing. Yeah, um, I think it's one of those where the movie was too long, and the editors really had to cut out uh, for length. As it was, it was over two hours long. I think it was like two hours and 12 minutes or something. But it was just, it felt kind of uneven. It's like, wait a minute, how do we get here? It, we just sort of seemed to miss a big chunk. And it was like, yeah, it was okay. Seemed to be heavy on sort of fancy special effects, but light and, and like just sort of drama and music. I don't know. It did, I, I was less impressed by it than I was... I was hoping to be. Too bad. That sounds like one I'll, I'll wait for DVD. I or, think you can. Yeah. And I wanted to tell people who have been following this series, Falling Skies restarts this weekend for its third season. And it's one that has held me where both Revolution and Defiance have lost me. What we're sort of seeing are these, these attempts at sci-fi where they're desperately trying not to spend any money. And unfortunately, they're succeeding, generally. So, they, you know, they're just sort of cheesy. They're, you know, they've got some special effects, but they're not very good. And they're trying to use people who are not, can't act, really. And the crying, trying to create drama from the setup. And, eh, I just, but I'm, I'm now watching... The end of the second season of Falling Skies. It came out on on DVD naturally just before the um, the third season starts because I had stopped watching it. But then a review said that I read said that you know the second season really did pick up and got really good. And I have to say I have I'm having a hard time not watching it. I mean I'm really enjoying season number two. So for anyone who may have given up on it or if you would. You know, if you've been waiting for season three, I wanted to let people know it is starting. And, uh, you know, you can find it at your at the torrent closest to you, huh. wherever that, that may be. <laughs> it's on TNT. Or TNT, which is, a, isn't that a free free channel? Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, it's available at, anyway. It's if you've got Maybe it's a paid cable, I don't know. And so rather than talking about Spinrite this week, because everyone knows about Spinrite. They that it better. Uh, recovers discs and kicks butt and so forth. 
Um, I just this sort of just I I was tickled by this because as I was going through the my the mailbag ye- uh, yesterday, I saw curse you, Steve Gibson, <laughs> and I thought, well, okay, that'll get my attention. Yeah, that works. <laughs> it's like what? And he, so he says, Steve, I'm a constant listener to Security Now, and I have a bone to pick with you. Back in March, you recommended a book called The Second Ship. And it's like, yes, that's the first. I, I did. I recommended the the row agenda, R-H-O. The row agenda is the trilogy. The second ship is the first of those. Um, I think immune is the second one. Anyway, so continuing, he says, I had a few extra credits sitting in my Audible account. So I tried it. It was so good, I ended up listening to all three books in a row. In this case, it's R-O-W. Over three weeks of driving back and forth to work. That put me behind in my Security Now and Windows Weekly podcasts, but it was worth it. After finishing the third book, I started listening to Security Now again. And in the next episode, you recommended... The Gibraltar Earth series <laughs> of books. I hesitated to try it out of fear of getting further behind in the other webcasts, but figured, what the heck? After starting Gibraltar Earth, I quickly realized I was going to get further behind oh, in dear. Security Now and Windows Weekly. <laughs> the Gibraltar Earth series was great. And three weeks later... I finished those three books. (laughs) Wow, this guy listens a lot. I have started back up with Security Now and Curse You. Heard you recommend the Atari's trilogy. Oh, I'm sorry. Antares. Antares. Yeah, yeah. The Antares trilogy, which, oh my goodness, that's the next thing I'm going to read. I, and in my case, it's in print. Um, I really miss that trilogy. In fact, I'm going to start soon, I think. He says, you're killing me. I'm going, <laughs> I'm going to resist temptation for now and get caught up on security now and Windows Weekly. Thanks for the recommendations and for making me fall way behind in listening to your podcasts. Oh, if so you do funny. mention this on the webcasts, I am sure I will not hear it for a month <laughs> or so as I am way far behind and need to get caught up. So, uh, Scott Master is in Colorado Springs, driving to work, listening to the sound of our voices, Leo, and you and Paul, um, and Mary Jo. So, once he gets caught up, I do, (laughs) Scott, I do recommend, I will say it again, the Antares trilogy may be better than all those other six that you... Oh, I... Yes, if I were to say... If I were to recommend one book for people to start on, this is Michael McCullum at sci-fi-az.com. He's there. Uh, you can get them in ebook and print. You can, uh, and they're non-DRM'd, which I really appreciate. It's like that's the way he wants to do it. He wants to trust people. Uh, they're all now on Amazon uh, in Kindle, Kindle format also, and they are all. Uh, on Audible, uh, when I when we when they first began to appear in Audible, someone sent me a note saying, "Hey, Steve, Scott, uh, um, McC- Michael McCullum's books are appearing on Audible," and I shot a note to him because um, I edited for him. I was the first person to see uh, his latest book um, and edited that, and it was actually extremely clean, um, e- edit wise. Um, and he said, and so we had a conversation, and he said, "Yes, they're all, you know, all of my books have been picked up and are going to be converted to Audible." You know so what? they have because they've got Gibraltar Earth, they've got the Antares series. Now they also have had Life Probe, uh, Maker's Book One, The Sales of Tau Ceti, The Clouds of Saturn, oh, Procyon's so Promise, good. Thunderstrike. So uh, Eleven books. They've been recording like little demons. Wow! If, if you have time. And it won't upset your podcasting experience. <laughs> Antares, the Antares trilogy. Book one. Um, is it Antares Dawn? That's I think book it's book one. Book? Yep, it's yep. in my library. You know, I was trying to figure out why the row agenda was in my library. The second ship. 
And now I yeah. realize it's because you recommended it. <laughs> See, I listen to you, Steve. I haven't gotten around to listening to uh, those. But oh. uh, I'll tell you what, this yeah. would be a good chance to tell everybody if you uh, want to okay, get one of these for but, free. But, go but, ahead. but Leo, yes, you, we can't lose you if you start listening to these. <laughs> we can't lose you. We so lost keep, Scott. Keep we can't listening lose to you. podcasts. <laughs> yeah. I've no, always wondered. producing them. Yeah. Well, no, you won't lose me because I listen. Oh. I don't listen while I'm working. <laughs> okay. That's good. <laughs> Unlike you, what, what you thought you thought you might you if, if you hadn't finished one of the Honor Honor Harrington books, you were gonna skip a show. I think it was. I almost didn't show. Yeah, it was like okay, <laughs> I couldn't go to sleep. I thought it was Tuesday night. It's like oh, I just yeah, maybe I'll just you know, I'll just put up a not here sign. Audible.com. And I'll tell you, you know, I I look at my library because I've been an Audible member for uh, thirteen years, and I have hundreds of books in here. Um, and uh, somebody was saying, hey, Leo, how could you have zero credits? Well, I, uh, I, you know, whenever I get my credits, my credits renew on the 22nd. I use them. Great Gatsby and Pride and Prejudice, The Descendants, Hounded, The Silver Linings Playbook, The Second Ship, and Tari's Dawn. These mm -hmm. are, I'm reading right now, Great North Road, the Peter F. Hamilton. It's funny. It's a procedural murder mystery set in the, the 22nd century, which is so weird. That's so cool. He must have taken the Paula character and extended her. Um, she no, out? she's not in it. But there is. Okay. Well, I don't. I'm not sure. I should say. But there no, is. No. There are callbacks to previous books. Right. Um, and the technology in it is the same. You know, there's smart dust. There's Ian e e plants. Universe. So yeah. somewhat of the same uh, universe. Cool. I tell you, um, if you like science fiction, Audible is a great place. But you see, I listen to classics. I listen to history. Um, I just, I am a fan, and I know you will be too. So what I do uh, is invite you to go to audiblepodcast.com slash security now, and you're going to sign up for the gold account. That's a book a month. That's uh, that's the way to start the addiction. That way we won't lose you. <laughs> just a book a month. Not a book a week like uh, that guy, uh, yeah. and, <laughs> Scott. And uh, 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 your first month is free. Your first book is free. Uh, pick one, any any single credit book, which is about 99% of all the books here are yours for free. You can cancel in the first 30 days, pay nothing, but that book is always going to be yours. I don't think you're going to want to cancel. I think you're going to want it. Stick around. Audible books. I tell you, it changed my life. I got my son, my 18-year-old, listening. He he loves reading, but he's. Uh, I think he might be dyslexic. He had a hard time... He's definitely ADHD, so he had a hard time kind of sticking with him. Mm. Now that he's listening to audiobooks, he has gone through a ton of them. Uh, a lot a of physics stuff. Yeah, Eric Rice and stuff. He loves physics. Uh, a lot of the uh, Richard Dawson books. He's just, he's he, it's it's an education for him. Audiblepodcast.com slash security now. Join today. And it's all right if you miss a podcast or two. Just, just not this one. Hey, hey as long as you catch up. You just got to catch up. That's all. Yeah. Uh, are you ready for some questions? You Let's do it. Let's do it. Starting with Richard Eaton, who says GRC.com is being blocked. Steve, I tried and rejected another VPN solution called Astril, A-S-T-R-I-L-L, -L, after numerous support emails. And finally, a level four support rep told me that GRC.com is blocked by Astril Thus, if you want to use it with that website, you're going to have to exclude it using site filter. Well, hey, at least they give you a way to do that. You know, you can say, okay, I want to see GRC.com. So I had to detunnel GRC.com. What are they hiding? Actually, the question is, does this have to do with you? Okay, so th this is relevant not only for Richard, but for... All VPN users, um, and I've seen some questions raised about Pro XPN, uh, that is one of the sponsors of this podcast, as, as we were talking about at the top of the show. What happens when, <clears throat> and this is something, <coughs> excuse me, many people, security aware people do when they're using a VPN, they bring up the VPN and then they go to check shields. They go to Shields Up oh. at GRC.com. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, when you do that, the IP address that GRC and Shields Up sees is the VPN server. It's not seeing you. Where right. You're, exactly, where your traffic is emerging. Now, 
what that often means is that there are ports open on that server on purpose. Right. For example, it may also be their web server. So they're using, you know, like proxpn.com that may be a server which is was also the VPN server and the web server. So yeah, it's going to have port 443 and 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 80 and and you know, maybe other ports open or if it's not a web server, they could be deliberately have their VPN client configured to accept incoming traffic on port 80. It's it, for, for example, I'm using that port on some of my IPs where I've got an open VPN server present because it is the it's very easy to get out of other networks where port 80 is your destination port. So they could be accepting incoming VPN client connections on that port. Thus, it's not a web server. It's, it's, it's the web server port, but behind that is their open VPN service. So everybody who has wondered um, need really need not worry. You'll see that the IP that we're showing is not your the, you know, your ISPs, probably, what is it, maybe, you know, 24 dot something or whatever IP that you see if you go to GRC when you're not through your VPN tunnel. There, the IP that, that GRC Shields Up service shows will be the IP uh, of them. And that's what anyone outside on the Internet will see as you because your traffic is being tunneled fr from that IP then it's encrypted and tunneled to your actual IP. Now, as to why these guys are blocking us, it can only be for this reason, and that is just tech support. Too many people were asking, hey, uh, why are there ports open when I'm using the Astral VPN and, you know, and I'm going to GRC? Unfortunately, Astral instead of like i don't know giving them a notice or 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 something i guess you really couldn't give anyone a notice you just have to block them they've just blocked grc so you cannot test your shields and they figure well that's better than having than worrying people or having the tech support burden so apparently it's possible to to with that vpn client say do not tunnel the following URLs or IPs or something, and so that traffic won't go through the tunnel. It'll go direct, and then you, you're, you're not going through the VPN, and then GRC sees you, not the VPN IP. But anyway, that's what's happening. It's understandable. Um, it's nothing to worry about um, because, again, it's not you, your ports being shown. It's the, the VPN server's ports. And I can see where it could cause a tech support problem. I know, I mean, I've witnessed it confusing people uh, in my Twitter feed who are asking uh, pro XPNs support people, you know, why are ports open why, when I'm why? using the VPN? Yeah, that makes yeah. sense. Some other VPNs may do. Does pro XPN do it? Yeah. They do. All right. Trevor Green in London, UK, wonders about SSL everywhere or most where. Steve, I was listening to uh, Security Now uh, in the archives when you talked about Fire Sheep. Remember that? Oh, those were the good old days. And, uh, I, <laughs> and how it makes session hijacking Life easy. was so simple. <laughs> those days. We take uh, credit card payments on our website, so our team has implemented SSL encryption everywhere. Enter the SEO guy. Our SEO guy insists we can use HTTP until the user needs authentication, then switch to HTTPS with HSTS for the remainder of the session. Steve... His idea sounds plausible. Authentication cookies are still only transmitted over SSL, but I'm sure I'm missing something. Will his idea work? Why are people recommending SSL everywhere? Is it because it's necessary or because it's simple? And I'm going to add the question, why does the SEO guy care? Correct. First, that, that's the one thing that hit me was he said that the search engine optimization person cared whether they were secure or not. Well, maybe... 15 years ago, but all search engines can crawl secure pages just as easily as yeah. non-secured pages. It's so, not a message to a, uh, a search engine anymore, oh, don't crawl me. 
Uh, Correct. Put that in the robots text if you want that. But uh, they, they're going to crawl into the SSL. So, tre so Trevor, here's the reason, and this is important. Um, it is in the transition from non-secure to secure that games can get played. So if you have a man in the middle, which is entirely possible with HTTP, there's all, I mean, there's all, there's, you know, the ways to do that are legion. It can be ARP spoofing. It can be somebody with a simple utility in an open Wi-Fi, you know, uh, coffee shop network, for example, who's able to intercept all the traffic. So they're intercepting the traffic in the clear and they see the, the page coming where the user wants to log on securely. And since it's over an insecure connection, they simply strip out the S's. They remove the, and the man in the middle removes the S from the end of HTTP on all the URLs and even the form submission URL. So the user who just assumes that they're being provided security has your site security stripped from it before and, and never able to come up. So they get a form not over SSL and they fill it out and they submit it and all their login information is captured by the guy in the middle. You have to have security up from the beginning or, or verifiably before you, you know, with, uh, with, um, transport with a HSTS style, so it can't be removed well before you start the login process. So it's just better always to have it. And the problem is, if you ever don't have it, you can never be, you, you can never get it. So if you ever allow it not to be secure, then from that point on, if every if every interaction is filtered, then, you know, normally w w when you're at a site, um, like, you know, the, the first person, the first thing someone's going to do is to log in. They're going to log into Facebook. They're going to log into eBay. They're going to, you know, present their credentials. Now, maybe here in, in, in this model, it says you take credit card payments. So there's a lot you can do on the site before you switch into that. But it's it's just safer if you're always HTTPS so that there's no there's no way somebody can wedge themselves in and then strip out the the attempted conversion to um, HTTPS connections good stuff uh, and what you really want you want to use that HSTS header and tell the browser we're always HTTPS for the next year or whatever, yeah. I mean, you know, I, you know, it's like for a long time, the browser will remember that, and then it helps the user to stay HTTPS. It's, it is. This is this behavior is quickly becoming the standard. It is. It's going to take a while. It's going to become the standard. You might as well, you know, be a leader in that. <laughs> Uh, somebody said maybe it's because it slows down page loads. It, uh, that doesn't slow it down appreciably no. on modern servers. Again, like that's 15 years ago. Yeah. That was a problem. Yeah. Now it's only the first connection where there is a public key negotiation. All current clients and servers cache the credentials that are established securely so that all subsequent connections come up just as fast uh, under HTTPS as under non-HTTPS, and it's not gonna, it's not gonna add more than a second, right? Not even a second. Not, not, even not, a not second. it's not gonna add a hundred milliseconds. Unless you have some crappy server that's way overloaded or something. Uh, Oasis, I don't know what that means. In Shanghai, China, asks, "Are my shields up?" Hi, all, long-time listener and, idiotically, a first-time user of Shields Up, your wonderful service. I live in a house with three people and seem to be the only one concerned about security, privacy, and redundancy in our home. 
In an attempt to help with our technical problems, I started to look into our internet and realized the tangle of wires kicked under the desk in my dad's office was not the same as the theory I had spent so many times learning, so many hours learning. But I, I didn't fret. I went to look at your site, and I used the relatively simple, as compared to the jumble of wires anyway, shields up service. The result concerned me. The results, your text summary below, showed most ports being closed. Now, back to the jumble of wires. Here's what we have. A residential gateway for the DSL line, which is connected to a switch, which is hooked to a router for each floor of the house. Wow, this is elaborate. This is the reason for my confusion. Every router has its own settings for the way that it looks at the WAN. So how do I know which router is the correct one to stealth the ports on, or is it, in fact, the dinky residential gateway, which, by the way, I can't change out. Now, remember, he's in China. Mm, uh, I know. Two ports open, 1,045 ports closed, nine ports stealthed. Uh, the ports that were open are 23, which is what Whoops. that's... <laughs> Telnet. Telnet. Ooh, that's not yeah, a good one to have open. And, not good. And 80, no. which is uh, web surfing. Um, and then a, a bunch of stealth ports, including the SSL ports, which probably shouldn't be... Well, I don't know. Uh, but it's probably ISP is blocking those. Oh, that's China. Yeah. That's China. And, of course, the NetBIOS, which should be stealthed. Um, what yes, do you think? And What's your 21, is, What's 20? 21 is, is FTP. FTP, okay. Yep. And then he's got the, the standard Microsoft ports, 135, which is NetBIOS, right. 137, 38, 39, 445. Um, yeah, so, okay. So here's what... I thought this was sort of an interesting configuration. Yeah, First yeah. of all, so it sounds like there's a a gateway, a, a DSL gateway going to a switch, and then he didn't say how many floors, but let's say three floors. So, and each floor has its own <laughs> router. Wow. So, and because, and I think that's the configuration because it says each has its own settings for the way it looks at the WAN which probably means that there are three public IPs, one for each router, rather than, for example, a single public IP on the DSL router. I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a DSL router. I think it's a true DSL gateway, mm. which is probably just bridging the DSL over to Internet. Then it's switched so it goes to individual routers. So... Uh, Uasis, what you need to do is try shields up from each floor. You tried it from apparently one router, and you got a particular set of results with just some concern, and I think should be. But you really don't want, if this is in fact your IP and not an ISP that is doing NAT for you, that is, you, you ought to look to see whether the WAN IPs are public IPs, or are they, for example, 10 dot or or 17 or what was it? Uh, you know, I mean, I saw, sorry, t uh, 10 dot or um, was it 172 through 17 something? You know, the 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 various private ranges. 192 um, 168. You mean or there there is that also, but yeah. there's also a middle size one that's uh. like. One, uh, I can't, it's been so long since I've looked at oh, that. Oh, yeah, um, it's if you get, if you can't, yeah, 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 yeah. Unroutable. It's like, uh, one, oh, I can't remember it either, but I know what you mean. It's yeah. like, one seventy two dot sixteen to 30, according to MSX. Yeah, there, there you go. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. That's unroutable, so, yeah. Um, so if it's, if it's, if those are the WAN IPs, then your provider is doing NAT, in which case the, the port 23 and 80 are its ports that are open. But if, if your WAN IP are public IPs, routable IPs, then you need to go to each router in turn, run Shields Up, and see what the results look like. Because then Shields Up will be actually showing you the, these ports which are open um, and closed are your router itself. So then you want to go, you want to reconfigure each router turn off the web server if there is one turn off the telnet port basically secure the wan side on each one but you will need to do it on all three of your floors since apparently each floor has its own router and the results you get from shields up will probably differ depending upon the router configuration per floor
That makes sense. It's the router problem. that you're connecting with at any given time. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And apparently they, his household has more than one. It's complicated, of course, because we don't know what's going on in China as far as the right. uh, Internet access. Right. Sam in Dallas commented about blocking third-party uh, third cookies. I'd love to be able to block all third-party cookies. I use Chrome. But it does break some sites. I'm job hunting, for instance, right now. And uh, most companies bounce you over to an external job listing service. Uh, blocking third-party cookies tends to break those. I've tried whitelisting the sites, but there's so many, it's just it's too much of a pain. Plus, I tend to forget about it and then wonder, why is this site not working? So he's just this turning them on. Well, this is interesting. I I mean, it's it's unfortunate because that we we are beginning to see as we've discussed on this podcast and I'm promoting it um this default um blocking of third party cookies. Safari comes that way from Apple and always has and I've always loved it for that reason and Firefox is struggling uh with the politics of making that same decision. But it was interesting from Sam to hear that he, he's had experience with sites that some sites that break when he's got third party cookies disabled. My take is third party cookies should have never been th th this is an abuse of cookies. This is not the way they were meant to work. They were meant to be a stateful relationship with the site you're visiting. It is this it's a a side effect, a side effect consequence of ads that they're able to also use cookies. This was not what cookies were meant for. So unfortunately, because there was this notion of third-party cookies didn't exist initially, some sites have assumed that they will be enabled in the same way that some sites are now assuming JavaScript is enabled. And I'm seeing many times, because of course I run with JavaScript by default disabled, thanks to NoScript on Firefox, I'm seeing notices saying, this site only works with JavaScript, turn it on. And then if, if, if it's worth it to me, I do. Um, it may very well be that we get to the same point where, brow where sites begin to say, this site requires that you accept third-party cookies, please turn them on. And then I imagine at that point, browsers will give us a way to do so. So, you know, it's really a function of the fact that they've always been on. And so it does, doesn't sound like there's a commercial incentive in this instance. If it's some sites bouncing him over to job listing engines, it sounds like it's just they've assumed the presence of third party cookies and they're they're relying on that as some glue between sites and and turning them off is breaking that glue which they've, you know, they've relied on. And this, you know, it may be the reason that we don't see everybody running with them disabled under Safari. There is a percentage of people who, using Safari who have turned third-party cookies on, um, presumably because they found out that they did need them. But still about 80% run with them so, off. So I'm thinking about what the scenarios could be that uh, a site could legitimately want uh, third-party cookies. And this would be a very, this one's a good example because uh, you're referred to a job, listing site from a you go to visit a site you're referred to a job listing site the job listing site might do something maybe collect information uh, and then send you back to the originating site is it not conceivable that there that there would be some third party cookie exchange here maybe the job listing is embedded in the first party site that kind of thing well the problem is that you don't you definitely don't need third party cookies it was probably just a convenience. Okay. For example, when when you go to the uh, to the third party site, the HTTP header, the referrer header, provides any information right. that this that the site wants about where you came from for like linking you together. So it's it's easy for that for the site that referred you to the third party site to send you back there afterwards. But you know they may have chosen to use cookies instead. Right. So, not you know, necessary. W w without really digging into the technology, it would be hard to dissect what the problem is. It does. It is certainly isn't necessary. It's just the way they chose to do it, and turning it off um, was. You know, I mean, the good news is, if they st if third party cookies start being off more and more, the people who implemented this site technology could say, oh. This is generally no longer reliable. Let's do this without third-party cookies. Mm -hmm. And they certainly can. Mm -hmm. 
So there's no technical, you can't think of a technical scenario where you'd need third-party cookies for a legitimate reason. No. No. Because that's not how cookies were designed. Right. They, they were designed was, to be first this, party. Yes, they Period. were designed to allow you to maintain a stateful relationship right. with a site you were visiting. So you could log on and stay logged on query to query as you moved through those pages. It was the whole concept of third-party advertisements which were being hosted by by the first party site suddenly it's like oh wow you know those we ads are this. putting <laughs> those ads are putting cookies on my on yeah, my computer right, right. that wasn't what the guys who did cookies ever intended no in fact they were very explicit that uh, no third party could read your third first party cookies exactly and, which i think tells us that the intent was very clear that yep. this kind of thing not happen Question four, uh, I'm sorry, five. Andrew Hallmark in Cambridge, the United Kingdom, wonders about the quantum internet. Steve, I'm a computer science student. When I heard you talking about the problems implementing quantum internet, that's when it hit me. Why can't we use some kind of envelope system that will contain the quantum data, and the only thing the routers will see will be the address on the envelope, thus maintaining the quantum state but still sending it to the right place? I have no detailed knowledge on physics in general, but I'd like to hear your opinion on this idea since I'm currently thinking about starting physics in September. Well, first of all, Andrew, um, go to physics. I've, I've, really? I've, oh, my goodness. I just think physics is so great. Me too. I, I loved it in high school and, and at Berkeley. Uh, I was, you know, was in engineering physics, which was like the tough one, the uh, physics five. And, oh, goodness it was just a joy and it's so applicable to everything you know that we run into later in life i've really found my my interest and love of physics to be worthwhile in this instance um what we're dealing with is bizarro physics i mean I, you know classic mechanical physics is almost intuitive there is nothing intuitive about, about physics at the quantum level it is just insane and i don't see how it would be possible to create an envelope because we're actually taking advantage of the like the simplest aspect of of Quant of the nature of quantum communication, which is the act of observing the quantum data changes it, and that change can be detected. And so I just don't, I mean, it's an interesting concept, but I think you've, you've formed a, some semantics that just don't make sense in the, in the actual physical world. This notion of putting an envelope around the quantum data I don't, I don't know what that means. You, the, the quantum data is the data that you're transferring. And the whole, the beauty of the elegance is that it cannot be eavesdropped upon. There's no way to, and, and this was when we were talking about an internet, it's inherently not internetable because the internet is about routing. And the, and, and the moment you intercept the quantum data, the, this optical connection, with a router, the, the, it is the terminating endpoint, and then you, you've broken your, essentially, your envelope at that point. And, and you, you could put it in, you could re-envelope it and send it back out, but then the point is that that router represents a, a point of vulnerability. So, uh, by all means, I, I, I couldn't recommend physics more highly. I think it's, uh, I mean, you know, it sounds like you're a computer science and physics interest, which would be a great combination. As long as you got the math. Yep. Got to have a lot of math for that. Brian Tanner in uh, Southwest Wyoming notes, you could store energy by pumping water uphill too. And I think I was referring to that when I was talking about the old school methods. Uh, this isn't the one I've seen, but it's the same idea. And he points us to a website, consumersenergy.com. I tweeted the link to this uh, earlier, so if anyone's curious, uh, you can look at my Twitter feed, twitter.com slash sggrc. I really like this, Leo. It's just, um, it's, a, it's a large reservoir deliberately elevated right. above Lake Michigan. and You pump it up into the, the water up into there. Yeah. Using and energy, and, and that's... 
the energy is reclaimable when you let the water flow back through. And and do you see the diagram down below? Let me see. Where, oh, yeah. Where, there you go. Yeah, it's just beautiful. But, I mean, it's, it's able to supply energy for 1.4 million people, generates some huge amount of gigawatts of power. I was just stunned. There's like eight pipes that come down from above, from the elevated reservoir, that are 24 feet in diameter. You could drive a semi through any of these eight pipes. So massive water flow to, gener to, to spin turbines, which run generators, which then double as motors. And so during the night or at off-peak times, they use power, which is less expensive, to pump that basically to pull water out of Lake Michigan and pump it uphill into this huge uh, uh, ecologically friendly reserve, essentially. And then during, you know, the summer months and during peak energy use when energy is more expensive, they minimize their, ener their external energy consumption by allowing the water to run back downhill. Anyway, I know, I know it was obvious. But this is just really, really elegant. I was as I looked at the page and read more about it. It's just like, well, this is just beautiful. Sadly, it was done in back in 1969 to 73. This whole thing was constructed, and you just don't see us doing things like that these days because mm -hmm. they're mm -hmm. expensive, you yeah, know. And yeah. this is just it's beautiful and elegant and and you know, bravo. And I did get some other tweets from people who saw this tweet and said, oh, yeah, we got one around the corner from us. So you know, <laughs> they they do exist in various places. Sure but they do. Yeah. I just wanted to sort of point it out. I thought yeah. it was very nice. Neat idea. Yeah. Uh, Andrew McClashen in Melbourne, Australia, wants to talk about and worry about BitTorrent Sync some more. He says, uh, here's my problem. Any newly created generation of a standard user-generated secret may collide with any other existing secret. And depending on how well their generator may collide more frequently than would be predicted, assuming 100% entropy. And for a breach of privacy, you don't need to find any one specific collision. You just need any collision. If someone else recreates the identical secret, they'll see the collision and be able to see your files immediately. You'll get no notice. You have to watch all connections to your machine constantly to see the new connection. Too late, your files are owned. Sure, finding someone's specific target is virtually impossible. That depends on good secret creation, of course. Now, just because it's likely to take a zillion years to guess your target secret, it can occur on the first try. At least for additional security, you can use 40-plus base 64 characters if you choose. So I'm advocating for an option to unlock, to allow new connections, and you monitor for the new connection. That's a good idea, actually. And accept it by arrangement. The other end gives you another secret, and you store that to allow both the original secret and the special access allowed secret to connect to your sync. Then you relock the system to only allow those that have already been gained access. This actually is a clever uh, addition if you're worried about this. This way you can vet every new possible connection one at a time in a very secure fashion. No one can gain access to your shared sync without you accepting them deliberately. And your own secret becomes very, very private indeed. No one seems to get this. It would make the whole sync situation secure. Without the lock-unlock -lock option, you have no real choice other than to make sure you encrypt everything yourself before you place it in your sync folder. A TrueCrypt volume will suffice if well secured. I fully understand that if you find a physical house key at a major train station, it would be futile to try to find that key in every house lock until you found one that opened. But that's a different problem, and house keys only have so many tumbler combinations. In the house key scenario, I don't, we don't have to go on and on about the house key. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, because this is it's completely not analogous. <laughs> um, okay, yeah, so yeah. Anyway, so, what do you, what's your answer? <laughs> so Andrew is among the people who are unnerved by the idea that nothing protects them other than that no one has guessed. They hope their their BitTorrent sync secret, and the the fact that there are. 3 times 10 to the 50 possible secrets doesn't put them off any. They say, well, but what if someone did guess it? And it's like, okay. I mean, there's no arguing that. Um, and, and first of all, we're still waiting for the protocol. 
d- d- disclosure. I mean, there there does seem to be additional bits. There's somewhere they're using 256. It seems that 168, I think that was the number, come from the user provided key, but the balance the balance of those making up 256 come from somewhere else. We don't know where else. So I'm still feeling it's a little premature to, I mean, we, we really can't audit the security of, of BitTorrent Sync until we have the protocol. And we do not have that yet. All we have is them saying, this is in beta. Here it is. Have fun. Um, and I think it is, Given that you've got good entropy, and he says, well, yeah, but what if you don't? It's like, well, yes, if you if everyone uses the same key, then that's a problem. But we're not arguing that. And notice that if you – the problem with the lock scenario is that somebody would try to use a key and they wouldn't be able to because they would be told that, well, sorry, that network is locked. Well, now they know that there is a network at that key. And then I have to just keep trying it until they find it unlocked. And, you know, and then you're back in the same situation. So, I mean, the, the truth is it's larger than three. I think it's 3.1 or something times 10 to the 50. And remember that was, you only needed, well, we talked about the number of molecules it's, it's in the universe. It's hard to figure out. Yeah. All that. Yeah. It's just, it's a ridiculously large number. It is never going to happen. Never, never, never. But people just cannot be comfortable with that it's, it's what i'm seeing and so i almost agree that there and, and even as you were reading it this lock unlock thing made sense to you it felt it you were you more just comfortable do it with it because it gives you yes i think people from, are the gonna adopt it from a psychological point of, people don't yes, understand from, the math I think that's the case. From a psychological standpoint, it's just it unnerves people right. that there isn't a separate username and right. password. <laughs> we like username and password <laughs> rather than just a really monster long password that is both. The the, the, the bit the BitTorrent sync guys are just obviously too attached to the, the, the cleverness and elegance of their solution and not recognizing that normal humans might might just want something else uh but well, you raised a very interesting point which is it does send a signal there is something here it's locked yes yes so uh, that's a that's that you know i mean i think it makes it less secure i think i think that that's the truth of it yes and the fact is how do you do this without any central management that's the problem uh -huh. the reason username and password works is Somebody you're always it. Yeah. There's a central manager, yeah. and we know we know how well that works. Yeah, because yeah. I mean, how how many passwords are get, being being blown by you know? Do you and think that this and, could be a, a system used uh, more widely? That um, I th I think I think the, the people look people don't understand probability, so yes. the, you know it, it's going to be something that people it bothers people. There's no no way around that, even if they understand the math, and even if the entropy is very very good indeed. I actually agree that, I mean, okay, am I using it? No. <laughs> uh, why not? Uh, yeah. Because you haven't vetted the protocol. Yeah, okay. I haven't vetted yeah. the protocol. Uh -huh. We have to have the protocol vetted. But the notion of sharing true crypt volumes, now that makes a lot of sense. Share that right. rather than naked files. Right. If you're not that concerned about security or you're only sharing your cat videos, then fine. Right. Don't, you know, just put them up there but if you've got the keys to the kingdom pre-encrypt them pre-internet encryption p-i-e pi is an acronym we've been using here for years and i would say that makes sense use this as your glue but don't trust it for your security yeah adrian justice in philip island australia another australian uh, shares his experience with advertising plugins. Stephen and Leo, thanks for all the effort you put into producing a fantastic podcast each week. I was put onto the show by my dad during my final year of high school. What a smart dad. Which led me to study security at a university level. Courses that reference security now almost on a weekly basis. All right. <laughs> Whilst working at my local computer store. A few months ago, a customer came into the shop with their laptop complaining about advertising on the internet we explained to them hey <laughs> this is how internet-based businesses make money that was fine until they mentioned that our own site contained advertising which by the way it's it's not true our site's always been free of advertising 
On review of the laptop, we noticed hyperlinks embedded in the body of the page. And we we talked with had somebody with this problem uh, last couple of weeks ago. Yep. When hovered over, displayed a pop up with advertising for products related to the highlighted word, as described by a listener in Security Now four hundred five. After browsing around to other reputable sites, even Google, we found similar links everywhere. We managed to narrow the cause down to a plug-in in Firefox, which was, by the way, the only affected browser on the system. When we removed the plug-in, I don't recall the name, sorry, the mysterious advertisements disappeared. We've since seen similar plugins for Chrome. Thanks again for the great podcast. Adrian Justice, Phillip Island, Australia. So I appreciated that because we were hypothesizing a malware installation and this confirms it we yeah. didn't know for sure yeah. we knew that there were sites that that from our own experience that were using links like they were hosting ads themselves mm -hmm. in that fashion which i find really annoying and you you indicated you had the same feelings but clearly there is malware which can do this too yeah. so that is i think what was affecting the chrome user that we just who whose question we talked about two weeks ago uh adrian confirms that he saw it in firefox and in chrome so it is something icky that you can pick up in your browser yeah and you know it might not be you got infected it might be you installed i don't know java <laughs> and along yep. with it, because, you know, with Oracle now in the encourages, search bar yeah, to install, uh, I think they install an uh, Ask toolbar. Yes, bar, Ask. Yes. Uh, that, that it, you know, whenever you install that shareware and it quickly went by that, it, yeah, we're also going to install a very handy little tool that will let mm -hmm. you, I think I've even seen it as a, not not as malware, but as a, you know, like a, you know, ad plugin, ads plus browser plugin, somebody said. Maybe that's it. Ads Plus is the software that uh, websites oh, use. No so maybe kidding. they maybe they Ads distribute a, plus. a a plugin. Wow. Oliver Stengele in Heidelberg, Germany. Gosh, I love the international <laughs> nature of our audience. I just love that. I come to you with a disturbing topic from the battlefield between technology and politics. Net neutrality. A few weeks ago, Deutsche Telekom published their plan to throttle the bandwidth of DSL connections after a subscribe, uh, subscriber's preset monthly volume had been exceeded. Oh, yeah, that's, you know, it, yeah, we, you may recognize this from your 3G data plan. Uh, however, a few select services like their own IPTV or certain music streaming services would be excluded. Ah, that volume wouldn't count towards a monthly cap. Their bandwidth would remain unthrottled no matter what. This, of course, violates the concept of net neutrality and either forces volume-intensive services to broker deals with Deutsche Telekom or to suffer and wither. The resistance to these plants already is underway with an e-petition to the German Bundestag, which reached the quorum of 50,000 signatures in only three days. Good. Yeah, the e-petition remains open for signatures from German citizens until... Uh, June 18th. That's that's good. That means people are aware of the issue. I think Nellie Crows, who is the uh, privacy minister for the EU, has also just in the last couple of days um, uh, proposed regulation, EU regulations to protect net neutrality. So there's certainly yeah. awareness about this issue. And, and it's, it's growing and it's good. The one thing I wanted to comment uh, is that when he, he mentioned that, for example, their own IPTV services would be excluded, one thing that typical users don't appreciate, only because they, they've never been in the posture and the, the business position of an ISP, is that not all traffic is priced the same. Right. That is, I, the, the, a, an ISP's own traffic does not cost the ISP anything. Where, because ISPs typically pay for transit across their boundary. So external services are are creating bandwidth that that they're and, and see the ISP is buying bandwidth from a tier one provider. And so depending upon their relationship with the tier one provider, if they're able to say, well, we're only going to need this much bandwidth in aggregate for our all, all of our uses in a month, um, the bandwidth that they source themselves is free to them, whereas the bandwidth that their users want from outside their bounds is not free to them. 
So, so there is that. I mean, I'm not certainly I'm not defending the lack of net neutrality. I really think we need it. But there, but the un underlying this is an economic aspect that the bandwidth is not the same wh if, whether it comes from the ISP or from you know extra ISP uh, sources. Endogenous or exogenous? <laughs> Actually, yeah. uh, the the uh, Neely Cruz um, regula proposed regulation. In fact, it addresses this specifically. Thank you to Nerve, who sent me this article from uh, ZDNet yesterday. Online throttling and site blocking will be outlawed in Europe under net neutrality plan. Nice. So they are addressing this. Nice. And um, uh, so they'll just have to. The ISP will have to factor it into their pricing model. Yeah. And, yeah. and no longer say, oh, well, we're going to, we're going to, you know, allow these and not those. I think the real issue, uh, you're absolutely right. There is a real cost to stuff that comes outside their network versus stuff in their network. The real issue is it's just a great temptation for an ISP then to use that as a way to promote their own business at the yep. cost of a business like ours. You're right. Because we sit on the other huge, side of that wall. Yes, huge temptation. And you set those, uh, you set those caps low enough. Suddenly, oh, well, I guess I'll just watch TV from my Deutsche Telekom yep. account or I'll listen to music from Deutsche Telekom. Uh, and so it does, in fact, impact outside businesses. And that's the whole point of net neutrality. And the fact is, many in many environments, there is not much choice of ISP. Absolutely. Certainly I have here no in the choice. U.S. Yes, I have no one to use but Cox for my cable right. modem. I have right. no choice whatsoever. Right. And so, so that's the problem: is that if you don't, if you, if there's no competition among providers, then they have a captive market that they can screw with any way they choose to. The waters are muddied because, unfortunately, and it's certainly true in the U.S. and apparently as well in uh, Germany, uh, the internet service providers are not pure utilities providing you with a pipe to the outside world. They are businesses. They're Comcast, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, or Cox, which is a biz which primary business is selling content. So yep. that's the problem. You have to kind of say to these pipes, hey, if you're going to be a pipe company, at least that part of your business, you yep. cannot favor the other part of your business. Leave leave the pipe alone. Right. The pipe gotta needs be a, to be it's neutral. Be a content neutral pipe. Right. right. And that's yep. where it gets very complicated. Because you're the art you're making you the art you just made is exactly what these ISPs say. But it costs us more to give a treat to your uh, viewers <laughs> than it does for us to show them to German programming. Nick Donnelly, our last question. He's in uh, London, although, well, actually, he's a Londoner in Saigon. And I think we have to have heard from him recently because that seems familiar. Yeah, that does. He might have been yeah. in studio, actually. I'm, anyway, Steve, thanks for the explanation on the BitTorrent sharing service not being brute forcible. I'm getting more excited about the potential of uh, BitTorrent Sync all the time. I also heard your piece on the Marks and Spencer customer having uh, one of their cards debited by the supermarket, even though they'd never taken it out of their bag. While this is inconvenient, it isn't the bigger horror. Isn't the bigger horror here that someone malicious with a contactless payment reader could walk around a street stealing hundreds of card numbers in a couple of hours, even if it's a low limit? The fact that it can be read at all at such a long distance and doesn't always require a PIN, must make this payment format largely untenable from a security standpoint. Here's hoping neither you or Leo have a stroke on this week's show. <laughs> uh, thank you. I think We've so far... We've made it to, we, to question 10. There's been no slurring or blurring of words. So I think we're in good we shape so far. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And I think Nick is exactly yes, right. I, I mean, agree. it is... A, it's horrifying. We have evidence from that report that cards were debited before the user entered the PIN for a different card. So even if the PIN were the same, th the debiting preceded any action that they took, which absolutely says you've got, uh, you have NFC, near field communications embedded cards that will function at sidewalk passers-by yeah, distance. That's not good. That's not and good. that is horrifying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Nick, thank you for bringing that up. I should have said it myself, but I, I, I was so caught up in just reading the story that it, I didn't 
add that, but absolutely. I mean, that is, people will remember that I was advocating a brief microwaving treatment of your card. I'm not, I'm not sure that you want to do that. They pop. But send, send it back to yeah. your provider and say, no, well, send this me is, one this, without this, this fancy This is why these smart cards crap. have never made it in the U.S. Yeah, it's not good. But all they have to do is require a PIN for all transactions and you're done, right? I don't like that, Leo, because, I mean, I don't want any, uh, just, why Why can't we just have little gold contacts where you just stick the card, you know, on a reader or I something? See. I know yeah. how magic radio is. Radio is right. just bad. You know, we don't even, we don't yet know how the bad guys are opening those car doors, but it seems to be some radio like, it's it's either high power radio or high power uh, uh, magnetic, right. which is confusing the car's network, I think, right. and saying, oh, look. I'm supposed to open now. Radio is dangerous. I, I can't wait till we find out. Radio, yeah, radio. Look at, I mean, how many times are we talking about security aspects right. relating to radio? It's just scary. You know, Lord knows Google got into trouble with radio. <laughs> Steve Gibson is the explainer in chief. He's at grc.com. Go there. And he didn't mention it, but do buy Spinrite, the world's best hard drive maintenance utility. Great for recovery, too. Uh, GRC.com. While you're there, lots of free stuff like Shields Up, Don't Shoot the Messenger, Unplug and Pray, Password Haystacks, uh, so many great utilities and lots of great conversation. If you have a question for future episodes, GRC.com slash feedback is the feedback form. Don't email Steve. GRC.com slash feedback. He won't even see your email. He obfuscates it. I don't uh, have email. He doesn't have email. No. Um, so just, but you make it very easy. GRC.com slash feedback. Uh, yeah. He also has 16 kilobit versions of the audio of this show for people with uh, bandwidth limits. He also has uh, transcriptions that he pays for. It. Elaine Ferris does a great job with those. So you can read along as you listen. We have uh, bigger uh, audio files, higher quality audio files, and video available at our site on demand, twit.tv slash sn. Or you can always watch live. I mean, it's fun to have uh, people watch live. I, I, we pay attention to the chat room. Uh, you can do that by uh, watching uh, Wednesdays, 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern Time, 1900 UTC on twit.tv. That's our website for the live streaming. Uh, that's it for this week, Steve. Have a wonderful week. Not sure what's up for next week. Well, I had there. I've got a whole bunch of topics, and we'll see if maybe something will come up in the meantime. Otherwise, we'll grab a topic which is needing some attention, and that'll be what we talk about next week. And there's sure to be one. <laughs> so tune in <laughs> oh, each yeah. and every week. And thanks to all the professors and educators and teachers who use Security Now uh, in their in their classroom in their yeah, curriculum. Really. I think that's great. I just it, it makes us feel really, really good to know that we're of this kind of value to people. That's that's the mission. So I'm glad the mission accomplished, Steve. 407 episodes and counting. 408 wow. next week. What a body of work you've created. That's nice. We've done it. Yeah, it's nice. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Leo. <laughs> Bye. Security now.